Hello and welcome to the final episode of season two of the Byron podcast. I uh, can't believe we're at the finale it's gone episode so fast. today. Uh, it's really exciting. I know, it's gone really fast, I think, this season. Um, And as promised, we're ending on a positive note. Um, Obviously, this season has been kind of surrounded with conflict and controversy. Like, that's kind of the theme we chose. Um, But it does mean that it's been quite sad in some places and a bit heavy, definitely very heavy season. So this time we are talking about human wildlife coexistence to kind of wrap it all up, wrap up this kind of human wildlife interaction theme we've been going with, with positives and how can humans and wildlife coexist. One thing I think we can conclude from all the stuff we've talked about in this season is that uh, there is no easy fix or quick fix to almost all the things we talked about. They are really complex and often very case specific. I think we use the phrase, it depends in every single (laughs) example we ever gave. But something we also know is the importance of biodiversity for the future of humanity and tackling the biodiversity and climate crises are the biggest challenges we have faced as a species. So I think we should probably start by just having a chat about what we mean by coexistence because I think it it means more than simply just existing in the same time period. It's much deeper than that. So what would you guys say are the kind of, what do you think of when you think of human wildlife coexistence? I feel like I went back and forth quite a few times doing research because I'd get I, I thought I'd found a really good example of coexistence. I'm like, wait, is that just existing <laughs> in the same place at the same time? Because um, I quite like this one website that I was looking at had sort of three criteria. So the first one was existing in the same time frame, same place. The second one was kind of living in in peace with wildlife despite conflicts with resources and things like that. And the third one was working proactively with nature and natural systems rather than against them. So I found a key point there being that proactively working with wildlife rather than just humans and wildlife are in the same space because I I then think there's not really a human engagement side that cares about the wildlife. But I don't know what you guys think, if you want to add to that. I think the most important thing, obviously I, I imagine our definitions of coexistence will be slightly different and they'll be, you know, slightly informed by the wildlife that we've seen and what we've read about and things. Um, but I think my perception of coexistence has been really actually quite strongly shaped by our fortress conservation episode and also the focus we had in season one of rewilding and species reintroduction. So I think for me, the, the biggest kind of barometer of human wildlife coexistence is being able to live together despite the risks to each other because as we know you know just by looking at the natural world no relationship is ever perfect you know rhinos coexist with lions but both of those species kill each other if, if they can and if there's a threat there so for me coexistence means being able to live together and working around and kind of bridging the conflicts that might arise. So for me, like the beavers is a really um, interesting model of coexistence in my head, especially in Britain, in that we can live together, but there are some conflicts there and we have to kind of work around that. And there's like, there's there's a fair few examples that we're going to do a bit later on in this episode. Um, But yeah, for me, coexistence is living in the same place and acknowledging that there are difficulties, as there always are, most of the time at least, but actually finding a way around them. And it's uh, uh, similar to, as you say, Emma, jumping off your proactive point, being able to recognise a problem and move around it, circumvent it. Yeah, I definitely agree that it needs to be a proactive relationship. It's not a passive state. I think coexistence, that would be something else. Coexistence means there's some kind of work involved with the wildlife. And I think to really say you're coexisting, you need to be working to the benefit of both people and wildlife. And so where humanity and wildlife are living side by side, but humanity is causing the decline of wildlife, I wouldn't class that as coexistence, I think, or vice versa. I think it's got to be where both human and wildlife are able to kind of do well and have derived benefit from the situation, I think, to be classed as coexistence. But I think it's an interesting point you raised, Roby, that our perceptions will be slightly different. And I think often when we talk about the kind of the inverse of this in human wildlife conflict you'll jump in your head to predators that we we the mostly have conflict with animals that pose a significant threat to our lives so predators or venomous animals really um 
or really big animals like elephants which i guess also would pose a threat to our lives <laughs> but things elephants that are really dangerous. either really really big yeah. or venomous or poisonous and you kind of something like a beaver you wouldn't necessarily jump straight to your head because those kind of conflicts tend to be more economic i think you kind of immediately think of something that could kill you and how can you coexist with something that can kill you but as you say it happens in nature all the time and humans are weird like we have this very strange very different approach in that because we're so social and we're so compassionate as a species and we've built up these big civilizations we hate the idea of losing any people and we do everything we possibly can to keep everyone alive for as long as possible whereas nature doesn't really work like that animals the survival of the fittest they kill off the vulnerable there's a lot of interest specific competition um so between animals of the same species and you have if a look one at like animal... a bird of prey on the nest that's ruthless yeah. but it works you know it's what keeps yeah. the species fitter and going forward so we're quite different to that so we don't really accept death within our species and then we don't really accept it from another species like one loss of human life is enough for us to kind of wage war on one animal whereas in nature if a lion kills one zebra all the zebras don't just <laughs> wage war like, <laughs> disappear yeah exactly they don't all like gang up and kill that lion they just they move on but we're different because we're so social and so compassionate i think what i was thinking about quite a lot is um the case of urban foxes because you know i live in suburban london uh literally on the fringe of surrey so i i can't leave my house after five o'clock in the evening without seeing a fox no matter where i'm going so i was kind of thinking oh maybe i can talk about this with urban foxes and coexistence but actually for me urban foxes are more kind of cohabiting we're both existing in the same environment but we're not really doing anything to promote each other the foxes are feeding off our remains, but we're still pretty antagonistic towards them. People shoot them, people poison them. So to my mind, cohabitation is not really what we're going to be talking about today. But coexistence, as as you say, Emma, it's that proactiveness. Um, and yeah, I've, I, I found this really fascinating to kind of research, especially because of the fortress conservation, all the rewilding stuff. And then obviously I was thinking, well, we've got to talk about beavers and white-tailed seagulls because that's what biome's been going off and filming. So it's been really, really fun. But I think the point you made about risk is really interesting as well because I think people might assume that with coexistence it all has to be, oh, like this lovely perfect environment where nothing kills each other. But like you were saying, Kate, in nature that happens all the time. You need to (laughs) recognise that there is risk. But I think it just has to be below a certain threshold. So obviously you can't have people being killed every day. I wouldn't say that is a healthy coexistence either. Um, But recognize that they might take some crops and you might need compensation, for example. They might pose a risk to livestock and therefore you need, um, I don't know, better fences or grant schemes or things like that. Just so you know that you might have to put things in, in place, I guess, if you are living alongside, like you said, venomous, large, dangerous (laughs) dangerous <laughs> animals <laughs> in that category yeah i think what you were just saying like leads on quite nicely to kind of why coexistence is so important because there's kind of three main reasons they're big reasons um because obviously there's hundreds and hundreds of reasons of why it's important but to kind of umbrella them into three sort of pillars climate change um is obviously the first one climate change may be caused by um, anthropogenic pressures so people our actions but it's impacting worldwide nature and wildlife just as much if not more than it is impacting us and the kind of our subsistence and future persistence and future on this planet so that's a threat that we all face and so it's something that we all are kind of in we're kind of in it together with nature and wildlife and so having coexistence is critical to combat climate change firstly because we need make the natural processes that absorb carbon like the rainforest and the oceans um but it's also because we're all it's a threat to all of us so it kind of brings us all together in a weird way the other one of the other big reasons why we need coexistence is obviously for species recovery um as much as we're facing a climate crisis we are facing a biodiversity crisis and if biodiversity collapses past a certain point humanity will collapse as well we are so reliant on our biodiversity and so species recovery is a really important aspect of humanity's survival and ability to thrive and so having coexistence is a great way to allow species to recover because especially in a a growing human population as we are um we need to find a way that we live side by side and the third one is because of zoonotic diseases and so that i think really holds up 
the reason why coexisting is so beneficial to humans that you can kind of directly see in your everyday life and but I think the importance of this cannot really be overstated and it's something that we understand more today than any of us <laughs> yeah. would have we're all ago. epidemiologists now <laughs> <laughs> yeah I think the who we are today and the society we are today at the you know a year and a half into the coronavirus pandemic we all now know that our relationship with wildlife can directly impact our daily lives to a huge extent because it's a zoonotic diseases can halt our economies our society in a way that was completely unprecedented a few years ago and so finding a way where we can coexist and wildlife can thrive alongside us will allow us to prevent the spread of zoonotic diseases and so there's great benefits to us as well as to wildlife and nature um and obviously to just the kind of healthy planet as a whole um so i yeah, no, oh, I don't know about you guys, but what I found really <laughs> interesting when researching this particular episode was actually how underrepresented studies on coexistence are in the scientific literature as opposed to studies on conflict on extinction. And on the one hand, I can you can kind of see why, obviously, extinction and biodiversity collapse and you know population collapse and the collapse of functioning ecosystems is happening a lot and therefore we need to understand it but it's interesting that people seem to be researching a symptom much more at least than researching a potential that's okay that's not true because everyone is wanting to find a cure for the biodiversity crisis but this particular avenue does seem to be somewhat underrepresented 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 <laughs> underrepresented my english is going sorry it's late tonight ma- massively <laughs> there was that um a study by someone called batia in 2019 and they were just looking at keyword searches in the scientific literature literature of human wildlife interactions as a whole and they found that 71 percent of these 250 papers that they looked at were focused on human wildlife conflict and only two percent were on coexistence wow so that oh, kind wow. of just shows you that like you said, Roby, there's just largely a focus on conflict rather than coexistence. Yeah. I definitely think that's that is true, but I think what's even more uh, like kind of taking a step back even further is that human wildlife interactions is still quite a rarely studied mm. aspect of conservation, and I think that's because, or partly because, we just prefer to study wildlife on its own than to bring in the kind of human element because it's much more complicated and we're a lot less familiar with the methodologies um, because they are so multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary, whereas we tend to kind of stay in our lanes and therefore we kind of don't actually study human wildlife interaction very much. Like 250 papers that they review, that obviously sounds like a lot and that obviously is weighted towards conflict, but compared to the number of papers you could find on just one yeah. species, that are purely zoology or purely ecology. Um, and I think, again, this this season of this podcast has shown us that conservation is, and the first season, as much about people as it is wildlife. If not more so. I, more. You know what? I'm going to come out and yeah. say it. After everything we've learned, after everything we've chatted about, I, I now believe. And I didn't when we started, actually. I, I thought, actually, we need to keep yeah. conservation about animals. Now, I have, I have gone on a transformational journey. Mm. No, yeah. I, I think conservation is more about people because we're the ones mm. who wildlife needs to be conserved against but we're also the ones doing the conserving so i i think it's Mm, a human issue i agree i think all conservation is really in this day and age is changing human behavior more than anything else um so we need interdisciplinary multidisciplinary approach and we can't just do zoology and ecology we need sociology and economics just as much along with so many other things and i think this is something that we are realizing more and more um as a kind of collective group um but it is quite new and I think that is why coexistence isn't studied so much because it's also quite a new thing again you mentioned the fortress conservation episode as well it's only recently we moved around moved from that model of separation it was so much before we were so much us and them and so we've only recently got rid of that so we've only kind of started even acknowledging coexistence in the last or 50 years um and it's just easier to study stuff you can count so like an impact rather than kind of studying an interaction a human wildlife interaction is is just a bit more bit more complicated i guess um 
So I think that is why. Because like you're saying, Kate, you're it's almost like conservationists very much focused on the animals and the behaviours and things like that. But actually, we're more looking at, like you're saying, sociology or economics here. Because when we're talking about coexistence, you have to consider agriculture and you have to consider livestock and how that's going to affect people. Whereas if you just focus on animals as as all three of us would quite (laughs) happily be sent off to the middle of absolutely nowhere and just study a particular animal same as you Roby I think with doing this podcast has made me realize how important people are and they will have to be important if we want to coexist I don't think we can have coexistence without I don't know changes to to that mentality and more to the point we're realizing more and more that there is no absolutely nowhere anymore we are everywhere our species has gotten everywhere uh and like it or not that's that's you know that's our responsibility and we have to understand we have to govern we have to self-regulate our behavior when it comes to these interactions that is something that the discipline of conservation biology Mm. does um even though it sounds like it's zoology still or biology um conservation biology the kind of as it was born and sort of defined by a guy called Michael Soul, I think. Um, or Soul, I'm not sure how you say his name, Soul. Um, he, it's, it was designed to be interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, and to bring in all these different angles, and it was just kind of called conservation biology, and that's, I think that's the future. That's how it has, it has I completely to be. agree. And I, I, you know, the more, the more of a mesh we have, the better suited we'll be to tackle the problems of the future and the problems of the now, because they're not going away anytime soon. Um, <laughs> yes. So that was a bit of a mind meld of the three of us of why coexistence is important, what coexistence is. Um, I found it really interesting that we all had a slightly different take on it, which is is quite nice, actually. I love it when we all start with the same source material and all go in different directions. Um, but in the spirit of this being the last episode of season two, we will try and keep it positive we'll end on a positive note i'm quite a big believer in looking on the bright side um hard as it may be you have to be (laughs) sometimes um so we're going to start off with some examples of human wildlife coexistence which we thought it was worth highlighting and which are quite interesting to chat about um kate would you like to kick off yeah um well the one that kind of always jumps to my mind is the shark spotters in cape town um that we did speak about in our shark safety episodes i won't go into too much detail but i think it's a really good example where you're dealing with an apex predator that poses a very possible threat to human life um and that's the great white shark um which lives in cape town um or the white shark as i like to call them but don't um, you think they're great i think they're fantastic (laughs) look at you look at a great white shark you think wow that's great i do think they are great i think they're fantastic i would happily call them the fantastic white sharks but i great i think implies this kind of deadly like okay, gore, okay. like might um and i don't i think it's um what's the word like fantasizing a bit too much it's not it's not a very scientific term i don't know um i just like calling them white sharks <laughs> but we all know what we're talking about the great whites they um inhabit the waters around cape town have done for a very long time it's a very well-known uh, aggregation site for them it's a very big aggregation site for them but it's also a very inhabited city with great surfing beaches great swimming beaches um and so there is this kind of conflict between sharks and humans because sharks do bite people people have been bitten in cape town it happens um but they have a shark spotter scheme there to try and minimize this conflict for a start and priority is human safety without harming the sharks and it works by keeping an eye on the water area and clearing the water if there is a shark in the vicinity and it works it does work and it's i think it's just a great way to allow people to be able to use the ocean still without you know with minimizing the risk of being bitten by a shark obviously that risk is never going to be zero but it allows you to live and use the water with this apex predator one of the most notorious fierce predators on the planet without harming the shark because a lot of other places a lot of other approaches to shark safety management involve killing sharks and if you haven't listened to our shark safety episode then there's a lot more information in there um but that's the kind of example that i always jump to because it's a really great example of coexistence because not only are we coexisting with an animal that's in a completely different habitat to us we're coexisting with an animal at the very Mm. top of the food chain do you know i always this is a complete side note but we've been doing this for quite a while now and i always love how 
pre- really predictably, all three of us will be guaranteed to talk about certain things given the chance. Kate will always talk about <laughs> shark spotters and rhinos. I will always talk about stork lady. I will always talk about stork lady. Emma will always talk about sloths or something of that ilk. And it's yeah. really it's really sweet when it comes up and I'm like, I knew that was coming. <laughs> And like, we know other examples, like I have so many other examples that I've probably never <laughs> mentioned that I could talk about, but I just think that the shark spotters are nailing coexistence. Mm. I just think it's the perfect example of coexistence. <laughs> uh, to, to add another example to that, there is a guy in California, uh, called I, I only know him from his YouTube called The Malibu Artist, and he flies drones up and down the Malibu coast all mm. day, and he spots a shark and he will lower his drone and hover over it, uh, and people will people who are surfing will see oh look there's a drone hovering over the water let's get to land and it's really nice because hmm. that that's coexistence whereas cohabiting would be something like the drum lines where they bait them and kill the sharks i would still class that as cohabitation yeah. they're both living there but we're just killing them um yeah so that's the difference for me what about you ever have you got a fantastic coexistence case study oh my god that works coexistence case study yeah great i love that <laughs> coexistent case study it's brilliant I think the one that really, really stands out to me, again, like Kate said, we have spoken about this one in another episode, which I think was maybe Zoology Ramblings, actually, rather Ooh. than Biome. So it's the other one that Roby and I do. And it was about elephants and bees. Um, and it's... I think we have mentioned this in Biome, yeah. because I think we're all obsessed <laughs> It's a great this. idea. Shall we go? <laughs> Let's just go and film it. <laughs> yeah, we should. I honestly think we should. It's absolutely incredible. Um, it's called elephants and bees project um it's kind of in the short name. and sweet <laughs> short and sweet and um it was established by someone called dr lucy king um in collaboration with save the elephants oxford university and disney's animal kingdom hmm. um and basically what this is i'm sure most of our listeners have heard about this because it's incredible um so it's looking for alternatives to electric fences predominantly in in kenya and because these were kind of dividing up the land, it was making it hard for elephants to move between places. Um, and also they're trying to tackle the problem that these very large elephants will walk through cropland and if there's something there that they want to eat, they're going to trample it, they're going to eat it, and they're going to destroy <laughs> the, the entire crop and water tanks as well because they get thirsty just like we do. And so what they decided to do was use these beehive fences as a natural elephant deterrent um so there were stories again this is why local people and local knowledge is so so vital in conservation who would notice that elephants were scared of particularly african honeybees Hmm. um and that's actually because african honeybees when they sting they sting like eyes in the trunk and they will release a particular pheromone that then causes all the other bees to swarm and it's really really unpleasant um particularly for the calves, which kind of have have thinner skin. And so what they did with this project, they built these beehive fences around these one to two acre farms where humans and elephants are competing for space. So the idea of cohabiting, like you mentioned, Roby. And there was conflict there before, and now it's been hugely reduced because just by having these beehive fences up, I think they they were found to keep up to 80% of elephants outside the farms. That's really remarkably effective because there's mm-hmm. not much that can stop an elephant going somewhere if it wants to go somewhere. Like, there's not much it can't knock down or shoulder through or step over. Yeah, exactly. I mean, to be able to use those natural solutions as well, it's nothing um, highly technical. It's these literally wooden boxes of beehives and they found that it reduces crop damage it's minimized human elephant conflict and also now it's helping the farmers as well with another source of income because they're able to produce honey which they can then sell and they're also growing bee friendly crops as well on their land which they're using to weave into baskets and it's sort of given the the local people a reason to kind of tolerate the elephants a lot more so like you said Roby the idea of risk there is still risk that they could raid the crops attack the water tanks endanger human life but if they're keeping up to 80% of the elephants out and now they have a load more income from all this other stuff I, I think this is one of the best examples of of coexistence that we have particularly in um, somewhere like Africa where people are living alongside 
very, very dangerous animals and they found a natural solution. So I really like that one. I absolutely love this example. Firstly, because it's so innovative. I just think it's brilliant. But I think it also really highlights what we were talking about at the beginning with the kind of interdisciplinary approach needed because you needed to know that elephants were scared of bees. Like You needed to have that knowledge of elephants and how they live and how they work. And that comes from studying them and being around them. But then you also needed to understand the human boundaries and the human side of it and where these beehives would be best placed, this kind of like more geographic sense of it as well and it just there's so many elements that went into making this project work um and so many different people would have been involved and i just think it's it's all come together so well and so effectively um so i just think it's really interesting because who knew that elephants were scared of bees like this is something that we had to find out through through studying them because as you say (laughs) roby they're they're not really scared of much else (laughs) no and that's what i quite like what i like about this particular example is that elephants are probably one of the hardest animals on the planet to coexist with um so when i was looking around zambia we were in the vicinity of south Luangwa national park we were staying just outside the park um and you'd have elephants come through the camp every night and you know rip things up and you come out in the morning and they're just broken trees and you're like bloody hell um but it's interesting that everyone there was so much more scared of the elephants than they were basically anything else um so the people who were walking around the camp at night were you know we said oh what would you do if there's a lion and they said ah well it's a lion Uh, you know you just shout at it it runs off and at the end of the day you can win a fight with a lion it's not likely but you can you know bop one enough that it'll it'll think think twice but there there's no way you win an encounter with an elephant if you don't have a gun or a poison spear and mortality between humans and elephants is actually really high when there is conflict because you know elephants get speared or trapped or electrocuted and humans get trampled um, and so it's really nice to see, actually, and I am, I'm guilty of this because I'm going to be talking about leopards and lions later on, but it is not just le- it's not just big carnivores that we need to learn to coexist with. It is large herbivores as well. And sometimes they're the most difficult ones. And it was so simple, this, this solution. It was so simple. It didn't need GPS. It didn't need, you know, a collar that sings whenever the elephants get too close. It just needed bees. And isn't that great? Bees are saving the world again, even more than they already do. <laughs> Yes, if people needed another reason to love <laughs> bees, and there you go. Yeah, it's a brilliant that's one. <laughs> do you have a, you, an example, Roby, that you wanted to talk about with coexistence? I do, and I, yeah, here's where I'm going to be guilty of it, because I am going to talk about predators. Um, but for me, this is particularly poignant, because we talk a lot about the difficulties, the potential and hypothetical difficulties of living alongside predators in the UK, potentially in the future. So I'm going to talk to you about the leopards of Mumbai, uh, Ooh, very cool. And, you know, a leopard is my probably my favourite animal. So, you know, Mumbai, second most populous city in India, seventh most populous city in the world. There are 20 million people there. But it also holds the world's densest population of leopards. So what's really interesting in Mumbai, it has, it, it has within the city limits Sanjay Gandhi, Sanjay Gandhi National Park, which is 87 kilometres squared. It is perhaps the only major national park inside a major metropolis. And was in, this on Attenborough's? Is this it was. the Attenborough's one? Okay. Yeah, it was in, I think, Night on Earth and also Planet Earth 2. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And in Sanjay Gandhi National Park, there are almost, uh, people reckon between 35, 35 to 40 leopards, which is the highest density of leopards any in the world, twice the density of the most productive African or Sri Lankan ecosystems. Um, I really recommend, and I'll link it in the end of this episode, um, a photographer called Nayan Nayan Kanolkar uh, did a piece for the Natural History Museum and National Geographic about him spending time photographing the leopards there. Now, leopards' uh, favourite animals to eat is dog. And I remember when we were in uh, when we were in Zambia and we were staying in a village called Kwaza, we heard dogs barking at night. And uh, the chap we were sitting around the fire with said, ah, there's a leopard about. And we said, oh, why? And he said, favourite food is dog. So leopards really like to eat dogs. Pigs are sec- uh, a bit further down the menu. And obviously, Mumbai has, it's thought, over 100,000 stray dogs. This results in 75,000 recorded dog bites a year. And over the last 20 years, more than 420 people in Mumbai have died from rabies as a result of these dog bites. So these leopards are now coming inside the city and there are these fantastic things. You can see them on YouTube or on the planet Earth, night on Earth, these photographers and these film sequences of leopards just walking through the streets of Mumbai at night. And 
the reaction from the local people is really, really interesting. So it's not one of, oh my god, there's a massive predator, we need to kill it, we need to tranquilize it and move it out. It's a kind of uneasy harmony. The people recognise that their lives might be in danger because of the leopards, and the leopards have killed people, and they have attacked people. But they also recognise that the leopards are actually quite useful for them, because they keep down the number of feral dogs, and that keeps down the number of rabies cases. So there was a really cool analysis performed by... Um, a bi biologist called Lex Kibi and Nikit Surve of the Wildlife Institute of India. And what they found was the area around the national park where the leopards kind of penetrate into the city the most um, only has 11% of the rabies bites compared to the rest of the city. Um, hmm. They managed to calculate it that the leopards actually consume between 800 to 2,000 dogs per year. I know, wow. that's a lot of dogs. And this saves the city of Mumbai about $18,000 in sterilisation costs each year because the city wants to sterilise the dogs. And so you've got this really weird, uneasy partnership here where the people accept the leopards, they accept that they go do a good service, but they also accept that their lives are a little bit threatened now. And so they take necess necessary precautions. They don't, you know, walk alone at night. They carry a stick if they're going back somewhere late at night. Um, they don't go into Sanjay Gandhi National Park at night. And this is what's really interesting for me, that coexistence with a predator is possible even when humans are inconvenienced, even when we are at a low risk. Because I think that kind of frames the debate about predators in the UK in a really interesting light. Um, you know, you, you think, yeah. oh, I don't want to get jumped on by a lynx. Never mind the fact that a lynx has never done that ever. And the people of Mumbai are living with 45 leopards. Uh, and I think that's quite admirable. Abs how... Have there been any instances of leopards um, biting or killing people in Mumbai? There leopards? have, yeah. People have died and they ha people have been wounded by these leopards. Um, but it's interesting that the community as a whole, and particularly the Wali people who live quite close to the park, um, have, 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 have seemingly come to the collective decision that actually, you know what, we live here, leopards live here, we've always lived here, leopards have always lived here. So they're leopards they might hurt us we're humans we might hurt them in retaliation but there's no reason we can't coexist especially when they provide a service um and i, I thought it was a really kind of an, an interesting take on that that was a nice bit of coexistence i think that <laughs> that is one thing though that's interesting i think where these examples where you have coexistence tends to be where people and wildlife have been living alongside each other for very long periods of time so the people in Mumbai are obviously used to living alongside these these top predators. Same with the people in Kenya living alongside elephants, which often I think when you get conflict is when animals have been brought in or people haven't had enough time to adjust. And so they automatically jump to the animals are going to cause conflict. So even with the beavers, the example you gave before, mm. Roby, there was so much initial backlash to beavers from various industries that it won't even affect them that badly. Yeah. But it's because we were bringing beavers back into a human-dominated landscape, whereas before there was very little kind of human conflict just because there were fewer people. So I think, I don't know, that is one thing to consider going forward with a lot of the rewilding movements is will people be hesitant at first because they haven't lived alongside these these predators or perceived dangerous animals um i just wonder if we, people need time with coexistence i i i agree that that's probably that's probably a reason why but i think deep down i i, I worry that a we don't have the time and b we shouldn't that shouldn't be a factor when we're considering it in in the same way, I think we need to get over this um, this block in our head that the slightest inconvenience condemns an entire species. Um, I think we need to be really realistic. So if, for, take the case of the lynx. Lynx pose no threat to people whatsoever. There's never been a recorded instance of attack. There's never been a recorded, recorded instance of a death. But they will take livestock. Even if you release them into forests, they'll probably habituate to other areas. There will be a threat to livestock. It'll be a small threat. But there will be a threat. And we need to be really honest about that. But I don't think that minor inconvenience, especially when held against uh, the productivity and the state of the British farming industry, 
I don't think that minor inconvenience should ever come up as an obstacle in the same way, especially when you consider the people of Mumbai are living with leopards on their doorstep. Um, and, you know, they're, 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 they're willing to go on coexisting. Um, and if they didn't, we would condemn them for it. But we're not willing to do it ourselves, I think. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. I think that this whole conversation kind of all I kept thinking was uh, such a critical aspect of enabling coexistence is mm. education which again in conservation you just come back to every <laughs> single time but educating people about wildlife is so important um, and I think the leopards in Mumbai like you were saying Roby the precautions people take like carrying a stick knowing where to go that stuff like that is so important knowing how to behave around a leopard knowing what to do what not to do the same with um, the shark spotters in Cape Town. Such a huge part of their initiative is educating the public on sharks, shark risk, shark like in you know, conditions that are kind of more inducive of a shark risk, um, and why shark conflict does exist and why there's a potential threat from leopards. I mean, obviously it's quite obvious these are apex predators, but again with the beavers the education side was so important so much of the conflict was from the angling community because they thought beavers were going to eat their fish beavers are vegetarian so that education side is just so important and i think i think you're right emma that time coexistence as it coexistence examples around the world now tend to be because they've always been that way they've always coexisted so they're still coexistencing rather than Coexisting. <laughs> um, <laughs> rather than trying to introduce it i think the shark spotters is a quite a good sort of newer example but um it's the, i think education schemes are going to be vital for trying to promote more coexistence going forward and it will be education on both the human and the, the wildlife side so educating people on the wildlife themselves how they behave what to do what not to do um and on our behavior and on how we need to change our lives because i agree we we can't just shut down at the slightest inconvenience and there will be we will have to make changes but these changes will benefit us as we have highlighted at the beginning coexistence benefits humans as much as it benefits wildlife um, and that's something as well that we need to educate people on is that having it might seem like having links and stuff roaming around is a bit of an inconvenience to you but actually it's massively benefiting the future of um, your survival so <laughs> it's something that i think i think that message that's, that's well. a re- that really hit the nail on the head you can't have coexist you can't if, if coexistence is between two partners humans and wildlife it can't just be wildlife doing all the work we have to be willing to give up something as well um, a really nice example I found of this is again big cats in India. Can you tell I'm obsessed? Um, <laughs> so the, <laughs> <laughs> the Gear Forest in uh, Gujarat uh, hosts the only remaining population of Asiatic lions. Um, the only lions in India, the only lions in Asia. Before lions used to roam all across southern Asia, right from India through the Middle East up to the Caucasus Mountains in Europe. They're all gone now because of us. Hey ho, we've got one population left. There's about 674 of them in the Gear Forest. But because the Gear Forest is quite small, see our Fortress Conservation episode, uh, around a third of these lions now live in regions surrounding the park. So they're not in protected areas. They're in agricultural land, they're in natural forest. And you'd have thought this would be a recipe for disaster. And in too many places it is. But it's actually not in Gear Forest. The lions are doing really well and the people are doing really well as well. And that's because there was a really good educational campaign. And it also helped. There was a receptive kind of socio-religious atmosphere that the people there kind of revere nature. They revere the lions. But there was also a really good and really kind of effective compensation scheme for lost livestock. And so the people around Gear recognise the value in their lions. They're the, they're the one of the kind lions. They're the only ones there. They bring in tourist money. They bring in conservation money. But they also recognise that the lions occasionally take livestock. And I think I think a couple of people have have been killed by the lions. Not so many as the leopards in Mumbai, but that some of some people have been killed. But the people there also recognise that the lions preferentially take herbivorous species that are agricultural pests, so antelope, nilgai, wild boar, chital deer. And so in their minds, it seems, the loss of the occasional cow to a pride of lions is made up for by the community development they bring and the effective pest control of the fields. And I think, uh, you know, if they can do it with lions, we can do it with (laughs) the odd links. Sorry, I know I shouldn't always bring it back to that, but the key point to remember there is the relation is not perfect. 
And I don't think we should expect mm. any coexistence to be perfect. Lions have killed a few people. People have killed a few lions. But on the whole, the people respect the lions. The lions seem to respect the people in return. There's this fantastic video of a, uh, a man and a woman on a motorbike crossing a little stream. And uh, they just drive through the stream and there's a pride of lions just chilling by the river. The people don't look at the lions. The lions don't look at the people. They go their separate ways. I'm not suggesting it's ever a good idea to cross a stream next to a pride of lions. But I think it shows, alongside the leopard example, that coexistence with large predators if, is possible if you're also prepared to give up a little bit in return. And they've now decreased their livestock numbers and they're focusing more on agriculture. So that's what they gave up. And I thought that was that was good of them. I think that raises another good point of as not expecting this kind of perfect relationship we also need to understand that what we're not here what Roby and Emma and I are not here trying to promote is that we all just act however we want mm. and let loads of predators no, come back and mm. just it's a free for all or that nothing would change and I think like Roby where you've been putting it, it's quite nice like saying we'll have to change our behavior as well because I think it's perfectly fine to coexist amongst predators like we did it before people are doing it now here in the uk for example we could do it again but we would have to be wary and i think as much as education as we were just saying is really important for successful coexistence mutual respect is also Mm -hmm. so important in any animal interaction whether that's with your pet or whether that's you accidentally run into a pride of lions on a motorbike you need to respect the situation and if you don't have respect for particularly dangerous animals you are putting yourself at a much higher risk and the majority of people who get attacked by wild animals they it happens it's it's not unprovoked it's not necessarily a, a predation of, event yeah it's not a predation event a lot of times where people are harmed by dangerous animals are provoked and that does not mean it's a deliberate provoca- provocation on the part of the humans and it's absolutely not the, necessarily the human's fault a lot of it comes back to a lack of education and not knowing what to do but animals tend to not just attack people out of nothing um particularly things like lions because we're not we're not their ideal food source and a lot of top predators are intelligent enough to look at us and realize we're not their top food source we're quite bony we're not very skinny we're not that in yeah like we're not we're not gonna be what they want it would be desperation or defense really is why they would attack us generally so it's we're not putting ourselves in these extremely risky situations but equally we would still have to modify our behavior to understand the risk that we are in and it doesn't mean you can just go one or not this coexistence doesn't mean just go walk off in kruger national park without any defenses yeah, i wouldn't like, do that <laughs> don't, don't do that yeah um, that's not what coexistence is you still have to protect yourself you still have to respect nature and that's always going to be part of it but there is a possibility that we can exist alongside dangerous animals without having to put a wall between us do you know, there was an, uh, quite an interesting... I watched a documentary called Living with Predators presented by Malaika Vaz, who's one of my favourite wildlife uh, presenters and someone I really look up to. And she went to Gear Forest to look to, you know, chat to people about the lions and see the lions. And she asked a chap who lives, you know, around the forest, oh, what do you think about the lions living here? And I remember really clearly, I watched this about a year ago, and the guy says, yeah, but I wonder what the lions think about us living here. And that's kind of got me thinking... We, our mentality needs to change. It can't be, this is us, this is our land. I wonder if we will permit anything else to live here. It's got to change to, this is us, this is them. We share this land. How can we live with them? How can they live with us? It's a bit like, like I guess, marriage counselling. <laughs> it's never going to work if only one person's doing all the effort. Hmm. You've got to have a two-way thing or relationship counseling i've never been married so i don't really know if that was a good analogy but i think it works um, <laughs> yeah it's the same as any relationship really it's, mm. it's com- you have to compromise a little bit um to derive mutual benefit because at the moment wildlife isn't deriving much benefit from our relationship with it and we are but only in the short term yeah. we're actually signing our own death warrant in the way we're behaving towards wildlife and the coronavirus pandemic is <laughs> exhibit a yeah. yes um, and so as much as it seems like we're doing really well at the moment and wildlife's doing really badly it's not the case at all these massive global crises that we are heading straight towards demonstrate that and so we need to compromise in order to both succeed and that's it sounds so obvious and so simple but (laughs) obviously it's not (laughs) but i think 
I think, like you're saying with compromise, though, I think another example that really struck me, or a set of examples with coexistence, like you were saying, Roby, is with the socio socio kind of religious aspect or cultural significance. Because um, we've got, I mean, Stork, Stork Lady, Lady. I will always um, talk about Stork Lady. About Maybe this is the one time I don't talk about Stork Lady because I've talked about her in every single episode. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we you you will know, have known about Stork Lady now if you've listened to our episodes. Um, the cranes in Japan, for example, you've got um, hyenas in Hurrah as well. Just where there's some aspect of of cultural that mutual cultural appreciation, like for animals living with people. I think that's another example where you you need very little in in terms of education and actually changing behaviors because the people in those areas already treat the animals with so much respect and almost this deity type view of the animals and that i would say is the only cases where the animals are actually getting a lot out of it um because the people are treating them so well but i i don't know if there are examples of that outside of kind of religious or cultural um, significance with animals. What I found really interesting is is what happened with Wally the Walrus. Mm. So if you if you follow the Biome Project, uh, we made a film about Wally the Walrus. Went down saw him in Pembrokeshire. He's amazing, great. A little bit concerning. He's not in the Arctic, but maybe he's a vagrant. We don't know that for sure. Anyway, so you know Wally popped up in Ireland, and everyone was like, "Wow, there's a walrus in Ireland. That's so cool." And then he came to Pembrokeshire, and everyone was like, "Wow, there's a walrus in Pembrokeshire. That's so cool." <laughs> and then he came to the Isles of Scilly, and this is what I think really caught my eye. Um, Because there was a BBC headline, which again, I will add in the links to this uh, podcast. And the headline was, Isles of Scilly, Walrus Wally, no longer welcome. And I thought, oh my God, what's he done? Has he killed someone? How did this, why is Wally not no longer welcome in the Isles of Scilly? And I read the article and it turned out Wally, this beloved kind of mascot almost, this animal we had formed a real attachment to, uh, had sunken boats. Because obviously walruses haul out I know. Sorry, I really no. shouldn't laugh. Walruses not... fall out onto ice floes. I'm. I laughed. Yeah, no, I'm it's just fine. imagining the process of a walrus sinking a boat, and that that amused me. I know, not for the boat I owners, imagining. not at all. But yes, no, that I, that is obviously awful. But, um, yeah. I laughed. It's just I, the idea I of this happening on the island. The Isle of Scilly. Yeah. It's just. I, okay, it's just classic 2021, isn't it? You just never know what's <laughs> these headlines. Basically, walruses haul out onto icebergs to sleep at night or onto the shore. Um, he can't do that in the Isles of Scilly. He can't go onto the beaches because there's too many people. So he saw these, you know, white floating things in the harbour and thought, oh, maybe it's an iceberg I can haul out on. Unfortunately, little pleasure boats are not designed to have one tonne of pinniped oh. falling out of them. <laughs> and I think he sent about five to the bottom and caused several thousand pounds oh, of damage. Oh, my goodness. Um, and everyone seems to ignore the fact that potentially the reason he is in the Isles of Scilly is because his own habitat and his own icebergs we're destroying, but that hasn't been mentioned in this dialogue. I would like to raise it here and now. Yeah. Um, Tit for tat. Honestly, the the way we're... We melt their eyes, they sink our boats. (laughs) Do you know what? It's, It's... the way it's, it's the way they're taking it. Imagine. Um, but <laughs> I'm just now imagining like a conference what? of walruses where they're like, right, I've had enough. I have had enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, lads. Let's go sink the boats. <laughs> and not not anywhere not anywhere you know I don't want to say important not anywhere major not anywhere notable but just the Isles <laughs> yeah. of Scilly. We'll take yeah, the Isles of Scilly, that well-known polluting um, population of people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, anyway, what was I saying? Um, the article said that uh, Wally would be retur- uh, deterred from sleeping on the boats using approved human deterrent methods. And people have said he poses huge risks to both livelihoods and potentially human safety. Boat users are being asked to discourage him from getting on board and to take steps to physically prevent access. So essentially, we'd rather this rare animal drown than risk lo- losing a few boats. Never mind the fact that we're the ones melting the ice in his actual home. Um, one statement said, unfortunately, his presence in a commercial harbour within an island community poses huge risks. First to himself. It's nice they're thinking of that. I mean, I think the risk of not having anywhere to sleep mm. at night in the ocean is probably also a risk. Um, but also livelihoods and potentially human safety. Um, and I was kind of like, well... Lots of things prevent, you know, pose huge risks to livelihoods and human safety. Smoking, 
uh, being drunk on the water, to name but a few, rough weather at sea, we don't seem to be particularly bothered by these. Um, luckily, this story does have a happy ending. So someone, and I don't know who it was, has dragged out an old pontoon and just plonked it in the middle of the harbour. So now Wally has a peaceful thing that he can sleep on and not sink. Yeah, I saw, I saw this on Instagram. I think it was yeah. um, a collaborative project. I think local wildlife trusts were involved and I think Good. Um, possibly a couple other NGOs. Um, I don't want to Good, they falsely deserve name them, but it was definitely a kind of... Uh, like professionals involved in this people who knew about wildlife and yeah. walruses potentially and so yeah it was a kind of big collaborative project with conservationists involved and so um and it looks quite cool um it's pretty big it's pretty sad yeah it nice place to sleep on it. <laughs> um so yeah very glad it has a happy ending because again we don't we don't want people's boats to be sunk that's not at all what any conservationist <laughs> is, is arguing for no but i also would not be happy with that being the reason that Wally had to had to go or, or passed away because we didn't help him. <laughs> we were yeah, inconvenienced. We were inconvenienced. Mm. We were inconvenienced um, is what we were. Imagine if it was a polar yeah. bear. Imagine if a polar bear swam to Scotland because there wasn't any ice in the Arctic and we said, no, sorry, you can't stay here. This mm. isn't your home. But a polar bear... Imagine like, polar what would that would be? be. So much more of an issue as well because they're quite dangerous and quite aggressive. I know. And they, would, they would attack people, <laughs> I think, um, as they would feel incredibly <laughs> vulnerable in this in the UK. A walrus, like, he's so relaxed. I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to so cross chill. one when he's they're so fighting each other, but he doesn't really pose much threat to human life um in his current situation and so like <laughs> in his situation yeah, homeless no. there's a situation at the moment but i feel like that just shows you how it can mm. flip in the sense that it went from this oh my goodness the excitement of a walrus yeah. and this admiration for a walrus to as soon as it's inconvenient it then turns into something negative which i'm very gotta throw in climate change here as well is very much the attitude people have towards humans have towards big major problems mm. like climate change it's kind of oh it's going to be an inconvenience like it's i don't want to change my behaviors mm. because that's inconveniencing myself whereas if we don't tackle these things now if we don't learn to coexist with wildlife if we don't learn to ch- change our behaviors we're all doomed so it doesn't matter really <laughs> like yeah. this is for your own benefit i think people don't realize that it's not this isn't conservationist preaching about wildlife this is for the future of humanity um mm. living alongside all the other wonderful things we share our planet with and that's yeah. often overlooked <laughs> i for one i'm really glad that wally has somewhere to sleep at night um fingers crossed he goes up to the arctic although i read a tweet and i don't have twitter so i don't know who it was i read a tweet through instagram of someone saying um i'm calling it now this is the start of a warm water uh, arctic war uh, warm water temperate walrus colony because the ice is melting and i was kind of like i'm gonna screenshot that just in case this chap is right and then i can be like you were a prophet my friend um so yes i'm very glad wally has somewhere to sleep at night and it's it's a rare case of good human wildlife coexistence in britain which i thought was good to highlight actually and i think it it highlights another kind of key aspect of uh, successful coexistence we've kind of mentioned education respect and a few others but um, and the ability to adapt to the situation is important because nature is very unpredictable. And uh, we've said this on the podcast before. One of my favourite quotes from one of my lecturers um, was, "The wildlife doesn't read the textbooks," um, or something similar. Yeah. So as, Wally definitely didn't yeah, read the Arctic exactly. textbook. Exactly. As much as we can study and having that baseline knowledge about the wildlife and the species and the ecosystems is obviously incredibly important. But um, which is something we've all dedicated our careers so far to doing. So I don't want to downplay that. <laughs> but <laughs> great, I feel really good about myself. Now. It's wildlife is unpredictable. They do what they want. They are wild, and we need to be able to adapt to situations. And I think being able, no one, you know, he was happy in Ireland. He was happy in Pembroke. He didn't sink any boats. And he came to the Isle of Scilly, started sinking boats, and we had to adapt very quickly to solve that problem. And the pontoon worked. And I think it's having these people with these innovative ideas and this quick and willingness to adapt that's really important for successful coexistence and i think for me as well looking forward the key thing i see to being um like enabling successful coexistence is this idea of rewilding humans i think it's Mm. been thrown around by a few people including george monbiot that it's not just about rewilding landscapes we've lost touch so much with the natural world you think now the amount of time young people are spending 
inside on their phones compared to even a generation ago our parents who were outside all the time we've we've lost that connection and unless we gain that back i don't think we're going to have the respect as a, as a whole in a modern society or the heads like any space in our lives for wildlife unless we rewild ourselves i really like that you know, rewilding humans i think we should do it so you know cave club campfire <laughs> yeah i'm fighting I'm mammoths all for it. i'm all for it i have to say like this was the one thing with lockdown that i think a lot of people realized but being hauled up inside was mm. terrible and we all yeah. got that appreciation i think this is a very uk centric thing to say because everyone's lockdown restrictions were different we were very lucky that even in our strictest lockdown we were always allowed outside for an hour yeah um and we oh did we take advantage of that like the appreciation i think everyone had for just being able to go for a walk anywhere but particularly in green space um, or natural space was vital and i think i'm definitely just like itching to get back into the field because i'm 100 just like "Ah." Um, and i think we need to spend more time outside and spend more time in nature not just people in the field like everyone we need it it's good for the soul it's good for us and it it helps us understand the importance of biodiversity did you see the tree hugging article that came out recently uh someone did a study and found that actually hugging trees is good for your mental health because it releases like a, a particular concoction of cocktails and i was like I didn't, I didn't know it, but in my heart I knew it. I was like, yes, <laughs> hugging trees. I actually saw that the day after I'd been editing some photos from um, Oban when just before we crossed over into yeah. Mull, and there was the pictures of Emma and I <laughs> hugging trees. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and then I was like, oh, it's good for the soul. No wonder we all had such a great time and so much luck with our wildlife. Maybe it's from the trees. Um, Okay, that, that needs to be our ritual now before we go on a shoot. Every time, <laughs> hug a tree, find a good tree. This is how you'll know it's us if we yeah. ever end up on TV, you know, if you're questioning who we are. If you see us hugging trees, that's probably yeah. us. Proud to be a tree hugger. I love a tree. The great and the good do it. Yeah. I was re-watching this season's, uh, this year's Spring Watch. Michaela Strachan on live TV hugged a tree. I thought, yes. Yes. Excellent. I agree. Um, hopefully this podcast has been a little bit more upbeat I think we will learn to coexist. The, the more coexistence we do, the better we'll get at it. If anyone ever did A-level biology, you know when the oxygen binds to the haemoglobin, it's it's hard the first time, but then once the first one's out of the way, it's really easy. I think it's going to go like that. And I'm not just saying that. I genuinely believe the more we coexist, the better we will be at it. So I am, on this note at least, optimistic for the future. Yeah, I'm really, I feel really good right now. I'm really glad we ended <laughs> on, a, on a positive note. And I think... We had to go through the really heavy stuff to get to this point. And I think as much as we all love to talk about good things, and I think it is really good, and I don't think we should just scaremonger people about the environment, but you do need to understand the conflicts and the controversies and these big kind of sometimes depressing topics in order to get to the positives at the end of the day. Because if you strip it bare, we are in quite a bad situation right now, but there, there absolutely is a way out. And so if you found this season quite heavy then we're sorry but we had to go through it you have we have to learn about that stuff and acknowledge that stuff in order to start moving towards the solutions and we hope that season three uh when we come back yes. we are going to take a short break um but when we come back for season three uh i hope it will be a bit more positive than <laughs> I, think it will be. I think it will i yeah. think it will be um shall we shall we tell them what we're planning we could, well, shall we just say we are going to take a, tri- a quick break, yes. but in that break, there will be lots and lots of biome content. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's actually some new and very exciting content producers who have joined the team. Mm-hmm. There's going to be a bit of an ocean thing. I'm not going to I'm not going to spoil too much, but there will be, <laughs> you know, hear the sound of splashing waves um, and there'll be lots of films. So we've done quite a lot of filmmaking this summer. Those films are going to be coming out after this episode. So if you miss us you can still yeah. see the stuff we're doing. Yeah. Uh, our Beaver films, our Scotland films will be coming out. Yeah, there's plenty of content coming out um, on the YouTube channel and on the website. Um, the podcast is what's taking a short break, um, but we will be back for season three. And the plan for season three, just a little teaser to get you all very excited, <laughs> is... Just to wet the palate. To, we want to call it Conservation Spotlights. And we this was conflicts and controversies and season one was focused on... <laughs> sort of rewilding mostly and lots of other you know incredible things that you guys discussed in in season one and this one we want to really hone in on the the detail so we've done two seasons of big picture and this one we want so big 
So yeah. Big. Yes. <laughs> too big. Especially too big. Too. It was very, very big topics. That Trophy we hunting. I was literally just like, oh my God. Yeah. So each episode is going to be a lot more niche. Um, we're hoping to speak to a lot more people, which is going to be really fun. Um, and we're going to pick specific stories and really zoom in on them. So if you have anything you really want us to talk about, um, then definitely drop us a message um, either through any of the social media channels for Biome or just comment on any um on the youtube video comment on this video um or yeah get in touch with us however you like um and we will definitely look into it for you um but yeah we're very excited to come back for season three i've absolutely loved doing season two um it's been really good uh, we've made a new friend yeah. you, know, you were the we started season two in the middle of the lockdown mm-hmm. and because we hadn't been out so far I think you were actually the first new person I've ever met in like a good six months, even if it was just virtually. Yeah. Uh, and then we met up and we did filming and it was amazing. Yeah. So I feel really happy because I, I just love how friends. we, I feel like we all know each other now as well yeah. as in person that we met. We've just, just doing the podcast. I feel like we now all know each yeah. other, now, which is yeah, quite nice. Definitely. I feel like you guys probably all feel like you know us all really well as well. <laughs> for us sharing our opinions all the time. Um. <laughs> yeah. Sorry about that. We do have a lot of people. Actually, I'm not sorry about that, you know? We all no, need be them. proud of your opinion, <laughs> Roby. Be proud of your yes, opinion. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, so as always, you can find us on our website, um, biome-project.co.uk, YouTube channel, and anywhere else you get podcasts is the Biome Podcast or the Biome Project. Um, Instagram, the underscore biome underscore project. Um, and then we're all on Instagram as well, uh, Roby Watkinson Wildlife, Emma Hodson Wildlife, and... I am Conservation Kate on Instagram. Conservation underscore. You had to think about Kate. that for a second, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, so much. I can't. I need to get this. There's so many social media I handles. Know. I need. We need to write this out and get it to like we a do. memorized font because I always think I forget one. But we're everywhere, and you'll find us. <laughs> you the can't only, get away from us. The only place I'm not is tiktok are you guys on tiktok TikTok. yeah that's the only place we're not what are you too much everything the light touches will be yours what about that dark and shadowy place you must never go there simba that is tiktok TikTok. (laughs) cannot go there um (laughs) but yes that is where you can find us all in the meantime and we will be back raring to go for season three very soon so we shall see you all then see you soon bye